Today's bonus episode of Henry Wilson and the Civil War will be the fascinating discussion I had with Professor Samuel W. Haynes on the annexation of Texas in the Mexican-American War. A huge thanks to Professor Haynes for taking the time to speak with me and provide some excellent insight into some of the wider historical incidents happening during Henry Wilson's life. You can check out Professor Haynes' work at samwhaynes.com. That's S-A-M-W-H-A-Y-N-E-S dot com. And if you're interested in what we discuss, check out his latest book, Unsettled Land, From Revolution to Republic, The Struggle for Texas, that you can also find on samwhaynes.com. Be sure to listen to Episode 3, The Texas Question, and please subscribe and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Thank you for your support, and enjoy the episode. My name is Sam W. Haynes. I teach at the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm a professor of history there. And I'm also the director of the Center for Greater Southwestern Studies. I teach uh, 19th century US and uh, the American Southwest. Perfect. Um, So the first question um, is regarding uh, the lead up to kind of the fight for Texas and why was Texas prompted to become independent from Mexico uh, prior to its acquisition by the United States? So recently, the struggle uh, with Mexico has been cast as a rebellion to extend slavery. And um, I think it's a good deal more complicated than that. It's important to remember that immigration, uh, American immigration uh, into Mexico had been going on for about a decade uh, before the Texas Revolution broke out. And um, three times, uh, once in 1826, uh, once in 1832, and then finally, Uh, in 1835, when the rupture with Mexico takes place. But three times Americans uh, uh, claiming to be Mexican citizens had taken up arms uh, against the Mexican government. So this is a revolution or a rebellion with a lot of moving parts. Uh, It involves Mexican nationals uh, uh, in its early stages as well, Uh, but it clearly morphs into a Um, an American uh, push westward across the continent. What had begun as an internal Mexican struggle becomes a new chapter in the expansion of the United States. And therefore it is um, closely intertwined with the sort of existential debate then going on in the United States. And that is the debate over the expansion of slavery. The, um, if, if you want to touch on what drew people to Texas, what drew Americans to settle in Texas? Land, uh, in, in a word. I mean, some may have been slave owners, some may have wanted to become slave owners, um, but land primarily. Um, land was, you could acquire a league of land, uh, a league and a labor of land, which is about 4,600 acres, um, at a time when for, uh, for about $100 and, in, and you would pay it in installments. And it's also important to remember that, that many American immigrants, uh, we don't say enough about the, uh, these people, I think, uh, were, um, were coming illegally, um, did not, uh, were not coming at the behest of the Mexican government. But certainly land was um, obviously free if you were a squatter, uh, but it was uh, practically free if you uh, had a uh, head right that had been granted to you by a by an impresario like Stephen of Austin. Um, land in the United States, public domain, was going for about $1.25 an acre, uh, had to be paid in specie. And um, this was an almost unbelievable bargain. And so the, the, what the Mexican impresario program was an almost unbelievable bargain. So it's no surprise that they, uh, that Americans, primarily from the lower south, uh, begin to come in droves uh, starting in the early 1820s. And the um, irony of the whole settlement program was that uh, Mexico had devised this program whereby land agents or impresarios would attract colonists to Mexico, but the terms were so generous uh, 
And the program succeeded so far beyond its expectations that once it decided uh, in 1830 to stop that immigration program, it found that it could not do so because all immigrants came, American immigrants anyway, there were some from Europe as well, but American immigrants came uh, hoping to speculate in land, just as they had speculated in land in the United States. And so to simply close the door on immigration uh, in 1830 uh, would have meant that um, the, uh, the number of people in, Tex in, in Texas uh, would be would not grow and the demand for um, land would plummet. So it was really in the best interests of American immigrants into Mexico to ensure that more people came. So when Mexico passed a law, uh, a rather draconian law, April 6, 1830 law is the name that Texas historians give it. Uh, when that law was passed, uh, ending American immigration, um, it uh, was essentially um, meaningless. And in fact, I think all of the evidence suggests that American immigration into Texas um, uh, accelerates after 1830. It doesn't drop off, it actually increases. And by the time of the revolution uh, in 1835, most um, American colonists had uh, come into Texas illegally after 1830 rather than before 1830. It's a rather long-winded answer. I don't know how long, how much detail you want to go into with, with land and all that no stuff. No worries. <laughs> uh, no, that, that was fine. Um, so um, I suppose moving on from just kind of the Texas question, but what were the factors, um, including Texas and beyond Texas, that were kind of uh, important in the buildup to the Mexican-American War and what actually led to that breaking point of war with Mexico. Okay, let me start by talking a little bit about the Texas Republic, shall I? Because um, Texas is a, Texas after the War for Independence becomes a, a separate nation. And for the better part of a decade, uh, the Lone Star Republic is a, um, uh, a new nation in the American Southwest uh, with a, a, a hopes, at least on the part of some people uh, in Texas to become a permanent nation state, rivaling that of the United States. At least that was the thought of one of the uh, Lone Star Republic's presidents, Maribel Lamar. Um, and to go back to my earlier point about slavery in the Texas Revolution, uh, I'm not convinced that the Texas Revolution was a war just about slavery or the expansion of the institution. But it's pretty clear after the um, rebellion is over that uh, white Texans uh, want to create a republic for white citizens. Um, this is, we see this in uh, the Texas Constitution, which is written at the uh, height of the rebellion in, in March, just uh, um, shortly after the, the Alamo, in fact, uh, the Con Texas Constitution is written in some haste, uh, but the delegates to the convention make it very, very clear that the institution of slavery cannot be compromised or infringed upon in any way. There are many similarities to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, it's probably um, more like that than any other doc any other political document, certainly. Uh, but on this point, uh, certainly the delegates felt very, very um, The uh, institution of slavery is not guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution, but it most certainly was in the Texas Constitution. Um, free Blacks uh, were um, expelled, um, at least uh, that's what the Constitution said. They had a hard time enforcing that. Uh, during the Republic period. Indians and um, uh, were not citizens. Uh, free Blacks were not citizens. Um, Mexicans were granted citizenship, but um, somewhat reluctantly, I must say. And uh, during the Republic uh, period, this decade-long era, you see the um, uh, a process whereby slavery becomes more deeply entrenched, the rights of free blacks become compromised. Uh, Mexicans uh, quickly find that the uh, uh, this that Texas, where they had, many of them had lived for generations, 
uh, it simply becomes untenable and there is this gradual um, migration out of the uh, Republic by Mexicans. Some flee into Louisiana, some flee uh, below the Rio Grande. There are actually very few Mexican Texans left when Texas is the next to the United States in 1845. And then of course, perhaps most famously or infamously, uh, the, uh, Texas embarks on a, a really drastic expulsion removal program of many Native American tribes. And so thousands of um, Native Americans were expelled from Texas during the Republic period. So when Texas becomes a um, when the Republic of Texas becomes a state in the Union uh, in 1845, uh, it is, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, a world for slaveholders and the enslaved. And so for that reason, it's going to become very, very controversial. The annexation of Texas is going to be very controversial uh, because by the 1840s, uh, the expansion of slavery had become the third rail of American politics. So um, Texas is annexed with great controversy um, in 1845 um, by the uh, means of a joint resolution. There was a treaty to annex Texas. There is no chance, no likelihood at all without going into the details that uh, the Senate is going to have enough votes for ratification. Uh, but a joint resolution, which only requires a simple majority of uh, both houses, uh, that is considered possible. Um, that The so-called Brown Resolution does pass, uh, but by an extraordinarily slender margin, um, the vice president pro tem of the Senate is needed to, uh, to break a tie. Uh, it is really one of the most uh, um, divisive issues that Congress has tackled uh, in, in its history up to that time. So does that lead to the Mexican War? Not exactly, uh, but, I, but it's certainly very much involved in the events that follow. Uh, when Texas is annexed to the United States, um, the, uh, the Brown Resolution, the Joint Resolution, does not address the issue of what the Southern boundary is. So the Southern boundary of Texas according to the Texas Republic, is the Rio Grande River. Um, that was a, a rather laughable claim. Um, when Texas was a colony of Mexico, the boundary had always been the Nueces River. So the land between those two rivers, what we call the trans Nueces, this was Mexican soil as far as Mexico was concerned. So that when Polk decides, the new president, James K. Polk decides, to uh, accept as legitimate the Texas claim. And he sends troops into the trans Nueces under Zachary Taylor. Uh, that is for all intents and purposes, a, an act of war as seen as an act of war by the Mexican government. It's also often um, characterized, and I, I think fairly, uh, that Polk, James K. Polk bullies Mexico into a war that this is, should be seen as a war of conquest. I think that's fair, but I think it's equally fair, uh, equally accurate to say that he blunders into it as well. Um, because if Polk was a provincial Tennessean, had, was a man who could not get the feel for another culture, uh, was clueless uh, with regard to what, uh, to Mexico's sense of grievance uh, by the, revolution itself, by the annexation of Texas, by the uh, decision by Polk to just sort of unilaterally assume that the trans Nueces uh, had now become American soil. For all of those reasons, uh, Mexican political leaders were absolutely furious, and Polk simply did not understand that. And he certainly thought that a show of force would um, bring Mexican leaders to the bargaining table and that proved to be a gross miscalculation. Um, so does he bully Mexico into the war? Yes, but I don't think he really understood the chain of events that he had um, been very much involved in. When US troops under Zachary Taylor crossed the Nueces River and marched to the Rio Grande, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, the United States uh, had, um, um, 
set off a tripwire uh, that would lead to war, um, which uh, occurs in the spring, April uh, 1846. And I would also say that after the uh, declaration of war, there are some early victories by Taylor's forces in uh, South Texas, uh, at Resaca de la Palma and um, um, Palo, sorry, Palo, I'm sorry, I cannot believe I just forgot those two battles. Uh, can I start again? Um, I've forgotten what I was talking about now. I, I wanted to make the point about um, Polk and, uh, and the outbreak of the war. All right, I'll start here. Once the war began, uh, there are some early victories uh, by U.S. forces under Zachary Taylor uh, at Palo Alto and Rosaca de la Palma. Um, Polk thought after those battles were over that Mexican, um, Mexico's refusal to negotiate uh, would now end and that a negotiated settlement could be reached. Uh, and he was, um, he simply uh, misunderstood the situation. Uh, then uh, Taylor's troops push on into northern Mexico, and uh, at each juncture, at each made after each American victory, and they were all American victories, a Polk assumes that Mexican leaders would negotiate. Uh, and each time uh, he realized that that was um, simply not the case. When American uh, troops crossed the, uh, what would soon become the American Southwest and seized Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then, um, uh, ports on the on the Pacific in California. He again assumed that Mexican leaders would negotiate. And what essentially had happened was that the Mexican government um, had become so was in such a state of chaos and disarray that uh, there really wasn't anyone to negotiate with. And so the war dragged on. So I think it's absolutely clear that if uh, someone had told James K. Polk. Uh, in the spring of 1846, when the war began, uh, that this war would drag on for a year and a half and finally end with the uh, American um, invasion of southern Mexico and the fall of the Mexican capital. Uh, I think he would have been absolutely, he simply would have refused to believe you. He really did think uh, very early on, uh, even before the war began and in its early stages, that a negotiated settlement could be reached. And each time he was mistaken. So would you would you say that, although, you know, you mentioned he kind of stumbled into it and it was, he was kind of mistaken. Um, do you think it, it worked out for him politically? Did it work out for him politically? Yeah, do you think, do you think it ended up being more successful for him? I don't think there's any question that, that Polk is one of the most successful presidents in American history. And I think you can make a pretty persuasive case that he's the most successful uh, one-term president in, in American history. He accomplishes everything he wants and more. Was he a popular president? Um, or did, that, did those successes make him a popular president? The answer is clearly no. Um, he uh, has never... Um, was never a particularly po popular president to begin with and became increasingly more unpopular in the Northern states as the, uh, as the war dragged on. Um, and he had always been seen as a, um, again, going into uh, all of the details, when he had been nominated in 1844, um, it was a surprise to many Democrats You'll often read in, in history books that James K. Polk was the first dark horse uh, presidential candidate. And I mean, we all know what a dark horse president, presidential candidate is. We know what that means. Um, but to many Northern Democrats uh, who were angry that he had gotten the nomination, he was seen as an illegitimate president. And so um, he was certainly unpopular with uh, many se uh, segments of his po uh, party, obviously unpopular with the Whigs. And as the war dragged on, uh, he became uh, more unpopular still. Uh, he had no intention of running for a second term. It was always his intention to be a one-term president. But uh, historians have always had a hard time dealing with James K. Polk for the simple reason that as successful as he is, uh, he also, 
you know, represents um, to many historians a, um, an expression of American power, um, unapologetic and brazen uh, expansion of American power across the continent, which they are uncomfortable with. Um, and so he's never been hailed as one of our great presidents. Um, and for that reason, I think we've never really, he's never attracted the scholarly attention that he deserves. Okay, very interesting. Um, so you, you kind of already um, hit upon um, reviewing kind of some of the key moments. I don't know if you had more um, to say on that. Um, you know, just kind of reviewing the actual war itself and like okay. the key moments, um, whether it's, you know, militarily or, or politically, just just touching on that. Um, sure. Um, there are a couple of things about the war that I would uh, mention that uh, I don't think get enough attention. One is <clears throat> Polk's decision to open a second front uh, midway, midway uh, uh, at the midpoint of the war. Um, in the war began in the spring of 1846. By the end of 1846, they had accomplished just about everything they wanted. Um, not only had they secured Texas, uh, but American forces had acquired the American Southwest. There were American um, gunships uh, guarding uh, ports on the Pacific, uh, which was very important for Polk uh, as a war aim. Um, he may have thought toyed with the idea of uh, extending American uh, sovereignty in, below the Rio Grande, but I don't think he thought very seriously about it. The simple fact is by the end of 1846, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy had acquired all of Polk's most important territorial objectives. But uh, again, the Mexican government was um, sort of missing in action. Um, there was really no one to negotiate with. And the Secretary of State at the time, James Buchanan said, uh, as did others, I believe, uh, that Polk should simply declare the war over uh, because they had acquired what they wanted. And uh, he refused to do that. He was determined to, uh, in his own words, a rather famous phrase, uh, he was determined to conquer a peace. So it was Polk's decision to open up a second front, front into Southern Mexico. And the reason that was such a bold gamble was because Northern Mexico was very sparsely populated. Um, the, the land between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande certainly uh, was sparsely populated. Much of the American Southwest was. Um, the, these were not the most densely populated parts of Mexico. He had, Polk had, had done the easy part. And so by opening up a second front, uh, he decided to uh, launch the largest uh, American naval um, invasion up to that time of Veracruz, uh, Mexico's largest port on the Pacific, and then march through these highlands, this, this mountainous region, the Sierra Madres, uh, to uh, the Mexican capital, a very densely populated part of Mexico, and also uh, um, these would then be battles not fought on open plains, much as they were in Texas, but in uh, mountain regions where American military advantages like superior artillery uh, were of no uh, whatsoever. And also the Mexican population uh, in the South uh, was much more loyal to the national government than the Northern provinces had been. Um, federalism, uh, a desire for a greater autonomy, uh, had always been very, very strong the farther away you got from the nation's capital. And so um, there were uh, many Mexican leaders, Norteños, Northern Mexican leaders, who opposed the national government um, and who really didn't do much to support the Mexican war effort. Uh, but that was not the case when um, U.S. troops landed in Veracruz and then pushed on into the interior. So this was a bold gamble on Polk's part. Things could very easily have gone badly. And uh, it was a, uh, a gamble that he decided to take. And in the end, uh, it worked out very well. Um, U.S. forces uh, uh, fought their way to Mexico City. And in September of 1847, 
the capital fell. And by that time, the war was almost over. Uh, the second point I would make about the war that we don't give enough attention to uh, is it's, it's pointed out and correctly that the US Army wins all of its major engagements against Mexico, against Mexican forces, and indeed it does. Uh, there's actually a second um, uh, a, 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 a subtext here, and that is that there was a guerrilla campaign in the north and a guerrilla campaign in the south waged by, by uh, Mexicans, um, militia groups, civic militia groups. Um, some had been bandits before the war, um, but um, there was a very, very successful insurgency, which doesn't get nearly enough attention in traditional histories about the Mexican War. People talk about Palo Alto, Osaka de la Palma, the siege of Monterey, Buena Vista, the battles uh, around the, the capital in 1847. Um, <clears throat> but not nearly enough attention is given to these guerrilla movements um, that are undertaken by Mexican um, um, partisans, and uh, which you see in both the North and the South, and which really were seen as uh, a, a very, very serious problem by American generals, Winfield Scott and Zachary Taylor. Yeah, so kind of, I, I suppose, um, in a similar vein um, of kind of both looking at the different perspectives of the war, um, less militarily, I suppose, kind of on the ground, what, what is your kind of assessment of how the American people viewed the war during the war and, and maybe contrasting that with how the Mexican people uh, viewed the war as well, kind of giving a, a more um, populist viewpoint on it, I, don't, I suppose. Sure. Um, one of the surprising things perhaps um, is that in Mexico, there is not a, an outpouring of um, anger at the American invasion. And that can only be expressed by uh, the bitterness uh, that many Mexicans, particularly in the North, the Norteños, felt toward the national government. And so um, you do see um, Mexicans in the South fighting loyally for the, for the, uh, on behalf of the Mexican army, but many of them had to be conscripted. Um, Mexico was a very um, deeply divided country along regional lines, along ethnic lines, uh, large swaths of the country uh, um, had populations that had never really been fully Hispanicized. Uh, Indians, unassimilated Indians who did not speak Spanish even. And so for all of those reasons, there was not the kind of uh, outpouring of anger that you might expect to see when a country was invaded. Uh, Mexico simply did not have a sense of Mexicanness, a, uh, a national identity. Um, there was uh, a strong feelings of national pride on the part of the uh, Mexican intellectuals. And if you read the writings, of Mexican writers during and after the war, uh, they uh, this really is for them a terrible, they feel a terrible sense of national humiliation. Um, but did the average Mexican feel the same way? I think the evidence is pretty clear that they did not. And the only way to explain that is just simply to point to, I think the absence of a sense of uh, national cohesion, which the United States did have. And when the United States, um, declared war in the spring of 1846, there was a groundswell of martial enthusiasm. And um, in fact, when Polk decides to turn to the states uh, who raise um, volunteer, uh, volunteer companies, uh, they have to um, uh, select men by, uh, by lottery uh, because the demand is so great. There simply was no shortage of men who um, white American men who wanted to go off to Mexico uh, and, um, and fight with Zachary Taylor or, or Winfield Scott. So uh, these are two very, very different countries uh, with very different, um, with, uh, whose populations had a very different sense of citizenship. Um, so I guess moving on from the 
uh, war itself and going on to the conclusion of it, um, how exactly did the conclusion or how exactly did the war come to an end? Um, and what were some of like the consequences um, and reactions to that? Okay, so the war ends for all intents and purposes with the fall of the capital uh, in September of 1847. Um, although it's important to point out that um, the war does continue. Uh, San Mexican president Santa Ana uh, evacuates the capital and continues to fight on for a few months. Um, there are also some in isolated engagements elsewhere uh, in Mexico. But for all intents and purposes, I think we can say that the war ends in the fall of 1847. And then in February of 1848, uh, a treaty is uh, signed between um, both nations, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Now, initially, um, Polk had decided that he wanted, a, he wanted larger territorial concessions than those that he initially, that he uh, finally got. Um, he was uh, in, at first perfectly happy with the Rio Grande as a Southern boundary for the United States. But as the war dragged on and he became more angry at the Mexican government's failure to negotiate, then he began to think of perhaps extending the American boundary as far South as Tampico, which is about 250 miles uh, South of the, uh, the mouth of the Rio Grande. Um, but he didn't get any of that. And that's, he only got what he had wanted initially. And there are two reasons for that. One is that he had sent a diplomat um, to Mexico, a man named Nicholas Trist, who, um, you know, communications being, you know, what they were in 1848, uh, really wasn't in close contact with Washington. It was weeks to, uh, it would take weeks to write a, um, to receive instructions and, um, and so on. So uh, Trist was essentially operating on his own and he cut the best deal that he thought he could get with um, Mexican leaders. Um, Polk was furious and in fact thought seriously about uh, tearing up the agreement and not submitting it to the Senate. In fact, he was so angry uh, that he refused to, um, to pay Trist for the final months that he was in Mexico during the time that he had actually negotiated the treaty. But uh, he submits it to the Senate grudgingly, um, but also with the expectation that, or with the realization that support for the war was declining fast and there was a very real possibility uh, that the Whigs might uh, scuttle any treaty which um, uh, asked for larger territorial concessions. It's in the um, early months of 1848 uh, that Abraham Lincoln sort of catapults to national prominence. Uh, he's an obscure Illinois congressman, and he uh, and many other Whigs had believed that the war had been waged under false pretenses. Uh, he gave a speech in Congress known as the Spot Resolution. Uh, he d disputed Polk's claim that the war had actually begun on American soil. He believed it had, been, it had taken place on uh, Mexican soil, and he asked Polk to point to the spot at which the war had begun, and these became known as the spot resolutions. So there's a lot of Whig opposition, and also, it's fair to say, growing Democratic opposition to the war. And so in his diary, Polk makes it clear that he's angry at Trist, that he didn't get the best deal that he could possibly get. Um, I think he's less forthcoming. Um, Perhaps in his own mind, he must have realized that uh, he was really submitting to the Senate uh, a treaty which gave him uh, the best possible deal he could possibly get. And it was an extraordinarily successful uh, treaty on the part, as far as the United States was concerned. Uh, it extends the American um, territorial sovereignty by about a third uh, larger if you include uh, the annexation of Texas, which had just preceded it. And this was all in exchange for the United States willing to forgive um, Mexican uh, debts to the United States, uh, which may have been wildly inflated anyway. Uh, so it was um, a national humiliation, of course, for Mexico. Uh, but the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo has to be seen as you know, one of the great diplomatic achievements in American history. And perhaps 
as a side note, it's worth noting that um, the United that uh, American Anglo American um, settlers in California were uh, panning for gold uh, in Northern California while those negotiations were being made. And it was only a few months later uh, that Washington realized uh, what exactly they had acquired uh, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, an astonishingly rich um, uh, vein of uh, uh, mineral wealth in Northern California. And the gold rush, of course, was on the following year. Right. Um, so this next question um, is what role does Zach Taylor play? But um, that's um, unless you have something that you want to say on this, um, I think I'm just going to skip this unless you have something important to say, because you mentioned Zach Taylor. I just wanted to make sure that uh, he was he was mentioned. So that's why I included that. But unless you have something special you want to say about his role, um, um, okay, well, I guess this is, I don't know if you want to use this or not, um, but um, uh, one of the more sort of, to me anyway, uh, sort of fascinating um, sort of what ifs in history was uh, what if Zachary Taylor had lived. Uh, Zachary Taylor dies soon after, a few months after uh, uh, his inauguration. Uh, on inauguration day, James K. Polk rode with him to the Capitol, where Taylor um, was to give his uh, uh, his inaugural address and accept the oath of office. And he happened to mention to Polk uh, on the uh, in the carriage ride from the White House uh, to the Capitol that he was not sure that all of the land that had been acquired by the United States uh, should necessarily remain part of US territory. He could imagine uh, splitting up much of what became known as the Mexican session into separate republics. Uh, and James K. Polk was absolutely aghast, uh, but of course that never happened. Uh, Taylor would, would be dead uh, within a few months, uh, as would James K. Polk for that matter. Right, that's fascinating. Um... So you did cover um, what President Polk's viewpoint was. Um, so I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to say on President Polk uh, during the war, um, but I think you covered just about everything, but go ahead if there is anything. Well, I guess, I, I mean, if you're, I guess you're going to talk about, I mean, the guy you're interested in is a founder of the Free Soil Party, right? Yeah, yeah if you want to mention, talk about that for a second as well. Um, yeah. Um, so there's a very famous quote by Emerson, and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, after the war was over, he referred to the Mexican session as uh, arsenic. Uh, it would poison the United States. And um, in fact, that uh, prophecy becomes uh, uh, all too true. And uh, here again, I think you find James K. Polk sort of fundamentally misreading the situation. Um, when uh, California applies for statehood, it becomes very, very clear this is going to be a phenomenally divisive issue, um, that now the expansion of slavery had become very, very important. It had not only uh, it uh, divided the, the countries along the country along regional lines, but it was also signaling signaling the death knell of the Democratic Party. And in the final weeks of uh, his term of office, uh, James K. Polk, in his diary, uh, begins to sound a, a note of alarm, uh, which you don't find elsewhere. You don't find he writes this diary starting uh, in uh, 1844 and. Uh, has entries virtually every single day, some of them quite lengthy, um, until he actually leaves the White House. Uh, and there is a, uh, a, a note of concern that gives way to alarm in the final weeks when he realizes the political significance uh, and the political controversy uh, which this war had, uh, had unleashed. Um, he was finally beginning to get it. Um, People had been telling him this. I think the um, 
um, you know, warning signs had certainly been there, but it was only um, in the waning days of the Polk presidency, they began to realize the truly um, earth shattering and seismic implications of acquiring this much territory, that it would unleash sectional tensions, which would give rise to the civil war. Um, yeah, and then just, just one last um, note, which I thought of um, was if you just want to like, not e just kind of briefly mention um, any like overlap um, in regards to generals, like within the Civil War uh, and the Mexican uh, War, not so much as like kind of its like road to the Civil War, but more as just like what generals served, because I know that there's a huge overlap there. Um, to any kind of notable. Sure. Thing. This isn't really my field. I don't know much about military history. Um, but I mean, it, it's often. Uh, remarked that uh, the, the U.S.-Mexico War, sort of a dress rehearsal for the Civil War, um, all of the notable generals, many of them West Point trained, uh, saw combat experience in the U.S.-Mexico War. Robert E. Lee, perhaps most famously, was involved in the um, major engagements before, um, uh, on the outskirts of Mexico City, when the, uh, just before the, uh, the fall of the capital. So, it really was a, uh, a dress rehearsal for many of them. Okay, perfect. Um, I, mean, I, I could list a bunch of generals, no. but I really don't know what I'm talking about. No, so I'm, <laughs> no I totally, I totally hear you. I'm, I'm certainly, I know a lot about the Civil War, but it's some of the military history just gets bogged up in my mind. Um, yeah, right. But um, the the one question that I have asked everyone who I've talked to um, was before I reached out to you before. Um, we set this up. Had you ever heard of Henry Wilson? Um, do you know anything about him? Have you ever encountered him in, in your studies? Um, I had to Google him after you and I talked. Uh, I didn't want to sound dumb, but I thought, how have I not heard of this guy? And then I realized, oh, we're talking about the Grant administration. Uh, and so my uh, knowledge of American history uh, begins to recede uh, very quickly after the mid-19th century. So I didn't feel so badly. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I think that's it's it's fascinating. I, I, I did read the Wikipedia entry. I hope it's accurate. Uh, but um, that was my first uh, introduction to uh, to Henry Wilson.